great biblical story is coming to its climax. We began with the creation of the world, the universe, and now we come to the grand finale, the last things, as they're called in Christian theology, the final chapter of the story. To get there, we pass from creation to the fall, to the covenant with Noah, to the call of Israel, and then to the coming of God in Christ with Jesus in Galilee, on Calvary, on Easter morning, to the birth of the church, to the gifts of salvation, personal and social, and now to the consummation of all things, the fulfillment of God's purposes. Remember how we portrayed this saga with two hands, the hand of God that reaches out to us at the beginning, the hand of our rejection, Noah's great covenant, the rainbow sign, the covenant with creation, and then the covenant with Israel, special place in the world. And then at the very center of history, the covenant in Jesus Christ, the center of the Christian story. And now we proceed to the grand final chapters, the church, creation, the coming together of God in the world, and the consummation of all things. Some radio and TV preachers talk about the end all the time, predicting horrible wars, Jesus swooping down and saving true believers. I think they call that the rapture. Then they return with Christ for a thousand years of peace on earth. A final battle with the devil happens. Is all this part of our story? Well, you have it all there. The last chapter of the story is on these matters, just like the first one. Do you remember when we discussed creation and the distinction we made between the who and what of the matter and the when, where, and how questions? The Bible and the Christian tradition they focus on the first, the who and the what. Some people push, as you were suggesting, for the second. Standard brand teaching about creation is, however, not interested in the time and the place, the how, the where, and the when of creation. That's the business of science. The heart of the matter is that God created the world not chance, not the devil, that the world is made up of an essentially good world of nature, human nature, and the mysterious powers and principalities of supernature, all designed for a life together, even though they go astray in the second chapter, just like the first chapter. So in this last chapter, we go for the heart of the matter, the who and the what, not the where, when, and how. God is in charge at the end of the story. That's who. What does it all mean for God and for you and me and even for nature and supernature? One sure way to miss the point is to wander off into the tempting territory of when, where, and how. The folk who like to take up timetables of the world when it's coming to an end or who want maps about where it's all going to happen, or blueprints for how it's going to take place, they forget about the centralities, the who and the what. Indeed, they ignore Scripture's own warnings. It is not for you to know the times and periods that the Father has set by his own authority. So we're told in Acts 1 to 7, Christ himself says, about that day and hour, no one knows, in Matthew 24 and Mark. Yes, indeed, there are some parts of the Bible that do have spectacular scenarios of the end of the world. In Daniel, and the book of Revelation, for example. But this is code language and ancient thought forms used to get the message through to the rest of us about the essentials, the core teachings of the faith about who and about the what of the matter. Could you be more specific? Just what are the essentials that the church is fixed on? The ancient ecumenical creeds that have been used in most churches for much of Christian history give us a good clue to the basics of the last chapter of the story. Take the version found in the Apostles' Creed. 
Christ shall come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Here we have four affirmations about the who and the what. Christ has the last word, the return of Christ. There is a final judgment. There is the resurrection of the body. There is life everlasting. Keep in mind that all our Christian hope about things yet to come, the final future, is seen, as Paul says, through a glass, dimly, darkly, for now I know only in part. That means we have to respect the mystery that surrounds everything we say about the end of the story and speak with modesty about what is known now only in part. Think about these four affirmations, then, as if they were stained glass windows. They're full of color, symbols, pictures. They do speak to us. They do let in light from beyond, but they are translucent, not transparent. A stained glass window, it's not a clear glass. It's not a picture window, but it does tell its story and give us enough light to read our hymn book by and to praise God. Gabe, could you please explain some more what you mean? Take that first point, the first window, the resurrection of the body. I always thought that Christians believed in something more spiritual, like the immortality of the soul. Mm. A famous church leader once said, Christianity is a materialistic religion. He's the Archbishop of Canterbury. Shocking? No. Uh, biblical scripture is full of concern about bodies. This runs against a lot of what passes for spirituality today. Things that stress the soul and reject the importance of the body in God's plan. To say we believe in the resurrection of the body means that God honors the body as well as the soul so much so that they both have an eternal destiny. The body just doesn't fade away while the soul goes to God. A basic clue to what that means comes from what happened to Christ. Paul put it this way, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. What the disciples encountered after Easter was not a floating spiritual substance, an oblong blur, but a visible, tangible presence. Doubting Thomas is reported to have put his hand into Jesus' wounded side. The biblical story is telling us that the risen Jesus was a hint of what we shall be. But again, Nothing in the world to come is just like it is here and now. The stories of the risen Jesus are full of mysterious comings and goings, including passing through walls. Body, yes, Christ's and ours. But a spiritual body, to use the paradoxical language of St. Paul. What's happening here is that the Bible is not going to give us a transparent look at things to come only a suggestive, colorful, stained glass window view. The resurrection of the body has its ethical implications, too, for here and now, just like all the other Christian doctrines. It means that Christians care about what happens to human bodies, just because God honors them in the world to come. The scripture is full of commands to feed hungry bodies, to clothe naked bodies, to heal sick bodies, and call to and challenge the powers and principalities of this world, political, economic, and social, that inflict so much pain and so much misery. 